Hi everyone, Salem Barahmi here, Director of PIPD with another episode of Dardashe, a series where we talk to inspiring and amazing Palestinians about their lives and their careers. Today we're joined with a member of Knesset, Aida Tomin Sulaiman, um, and we're honored to have you. How are you and how are you holding up? Well, um, first of all, thank you. Thank you for hosting me. It's an honor to be on your uh, program. And uh, we're holding. It's, uh, it's tough times, but uh, we are holding. It's okay. That's we're good. That, that's good to hear. Yeah, there's a, lot, there's a lot to deal with, you know, from viruses to annexation, and we'll get into all of that. But before so... I the human viruses. <laughs> exactly. Um, I wanted to, for a lot of people around the world uh, who might not know um, that one, uh, Palestinians make up a decent percentage of Israeli society, but also that for a lot of Palestinians uh, in, in 48, um, you know, I'm sure your parents and your grandparents, one day they were living in Palestine and then the next it, it was Israel. And so, I want to be able to give a sense to people around the world what that must have been like for you, for your family, and, and kind of your understanding of it growing up as a child. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's really interesting yeah, because um, I have a little bit different story than other Palestinians who have been, uh, who have gone through a Nakba and then maybe became either refugees in West Bank or refugees in the Arab world or you know, all over. And usually there are stories about how the um, Palestinians, the refugee Palestinians, uh, used to tell their uh, uh, about the village they used to live, about Palestine, and even to draw a very uh, uh, nice picture of what Palestine was like. I'm coming from, uh, uh, and usually those who became also displaced inside 1948 territory, uh, which became Israel, used to tell also their uh, children to take them to see the ruins of their villages and to tell them there was our house and these were our uh, uh, lands, etc. I grew up in a family which is a very small family, uh, did not have this ex extended family, Hamula, where um, I used to be told about my cousins, for example, who became refugees in Lebanon. We didn't have these stories. Mm -hmm. My father uh, was raised as a refugee, uh, as, sorry, as uh, an orphanage. Uh, my daughter, my mother, also her parents originally from Nazareth. We stayed in Nazareth. Nobody was was displaced, and for some reason, for many many years, Nakba stories were not told in my house. Mm -hmm. There was no real stories to tell me what was going on until one day I came to my mom, and I was like around thirty years old with two daughters of mine and I was I asked her mom how where were you through Nakba mm -hmm. and she here in Nazareth and I said um why you never told us what happened what do you remember from a Nakba and my mother was young enough to to remember and to understand what was going on in the Nakba. And she started telling me the stories how my grandfather, because they were living up on, on a mountain in Nazareth with a distance from the center of the city, uh, was afraid that the Jews or the uh, groups of, of, of uh, militarized Jews will, will come from the mountain and they will be the only family there and he was afraid what will happen to his family. So he took them and he went down the mountain and through they were passing by. The first house was for a widow with her children. And she asked him, where are you going? And he said, we are going to the church 
uh, so that we can hide in a church and if you are in God's house, uh, nobody will harm you because mm -hmm. in a church, the army will never go there. And that's what he thought at least. And this uh, uh, neighbor uh, was a Muslim woman. Mm -hmm. She said, would you take me with you, with my children? I said, of course. And they went together. And my mom says that when they were approaching the churchyard, which was exactly in front till today, uh, the Muslim uh, um, uh, graveyard, mm -hmm. they saw some men with hatta, with kufiya, on their heads hiding between the graves. And Imm Hussein, who was our neighbor, uh, thought they were the Arab fighters, Palestinian fighters, or Arab from the armies that were mm -hmm. in Palestine at that point. And she was so happy that they came to rescue them. And she was uh, uh, greeting them. And suddenly, some of those men came out and shooted her. And it turned out that they were from the Jewish uh, uh, militarized groups and, and they shooted her because she was calling for the Arab army. This woman was in the churchyard for two days in July mm -hmm. until my grandfather could crawl and pull her uh, uh, um, uh, uh, body inside and to bury her in two days later. And my mom was a witness for that and for another two or three stories. And I asked her, how come you never mentioned that? And she said one sentence, how telling you this would help you in your life. Mm. Then I started to understand that the Palestinians who stayed in their homeland were so traumatic, like the Palestinians who became refugees. But in order to cope and to try to survive this huge change in their life and to survive the fact of the new state that was established on their ruins, they did not tell stories. Yeah, you know it's 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 very interesting. We we spoke to Palestinians from all over the world, and they also spoke about how their parents or grandparents would not talk about the Nakba, you know, it, it don't wouldn't tell them the stories because of trauma, and because of and and the fear, and it's something that's that is almost within our DNA now that that seems to be that is passed on from generation to generation. Um, it's, it's known that many people who went through traumatic events, the first generation, this is a kind of psychological uh, uh, mechanism of surviving, that they block their feelings about those events in order to be able to continue further. And it's usually the second or the third generation who start to ask questions. Mm -hmm. and to know what's happening and for me that was an eye-opening moment when my mom said to me and if i tell you if i told i've told you what would have that helped you in your life so as if she was protecting mm -hmm. us from telling us those horrible events can I ask you, you, you mentioned something about generations and, and the trauma and dealing with it. Do you feel like the, the, the generation, your mother's generation, the one that, that, that witnessed the Nakba and, and lived through it, did they immediately feel the need to survive in, in, a, in what essentially was, because they, they were under military uh, rule, right? A lot of people forget for the first 20 years from 48 to 68, about roughly, it was under military law. Um, yeah. Yes. Yeah. How how was that uh, for them? You know, in terms of that generation, how how did they go about living under such a situation? Well, first of all, I think that um, 
many of them understood, first of all, that they lost everything almost. And they need to find a way to continue to live uh, and to earn their living because most of them lost the land and lost the uh, possibility or, or whatever they had before, if it is a job or um, uh, owning a land and living from agriculture. And sometimes they lost their homes even mm -hmm. and, and became displaced and have to start from scratch when they don't have anything with them and you know there are some there is some literature for example if you read Saeed Abin Nahs al Mutashail, the uh, optimist you, you I think it was translated into optimist um, or uh, uh, he he tells how the people tried to cope with this new situation, but they were very, very afraid. They were busy of how to survive. For example, I was the first one in my uh, family to go to the university. Mm -hmm. I, even if it is 20 years almost after finishing the military role, uh, my my mom told me the first thing my mom had to tell me when I went to the university. You're going to study. Don't do politics. <laughs> <laughs> For them, doing politics is a very dangerous thing because they still had in their mind the first of all the fact that the uh, um, intelligence, the Israeli intelligence, is controlling everything and is watching everything and we were i i still remember when we used to laugh about this today i think we shouldn't laugh at all because this is a reality and mm -hmm. our parents were more wise when they understood that second i think that uh, uh, there was also a, a very uh, 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 real and these were the let's say the ordinary people but there was also a very strong need for resistance a different kind of resistance uh, for example my father was not a fighter was not a protester he did not participate in any political uh, organization but for him uh, to refuse to be appointed as a teacher in the Israeli uh, uh, education system, part of his resistance, because he understood at that point, if he will be appointed, he will be asked also to inform on different political uh, organizations around him or people who were active politically. Mm -hmm. There was also a very high respect to those who were active under the military role and mainly it was mainly the communists at that point. Mm -hmm. um, I still remember the story of my father-in-law who told me that he was put in um, an a, 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 um, arresting camp that was developed in 1948 near the villages of Deir al-Assad and uh, al Bani. Mm -hmm. uh, in the uh, Galilee, Western Galilee. He never told us this story, that he was six months uh, uh, arrested after they, and then one day in the second intifada, he was sitting in front of TV and he was an old man already. And he saw how the army, the Israeli occupation army is bringing all the young men uh, and putting them in a school yard while they were sitting, you know, on their knees and, and with their hands on top of their head. And he started crying. And I asked him, what's going on? And mm -hmm. he said, this is how they seeded us in 1948. Wow. And he told me then that they brought all the men between 15 up till 50 into big yard in Bani Der al-Assad and it was really hot summer for hours they were sitting like this the way he saw in tv and they were 
thirsty and they were asking to take some water and he wanted and the army told them okay two from there asa two from bani come up and go and bring water and he wanted to go and I, a man was sitting near him pushed him down and he said don't stand up wait and the minute two and two four men were up to bring water they were shooted and killed wow. and he he then all of them were taken and are being arrested for six months and there was protest inside that camp every day mm -hmm. and he told me stories about men who led those protests so there was on one hand those who had the uh, uh, energy and the political awareness to protest and to uh, uh, resist and those who found other ways to resist not in confrontation but in isolating and refusing to be part of the new system mm -hmm. or the new uh, system and to pay a, a price for that. Yeah. Yeah, it's it, it must have been extremely hard during during the the that initial the creation of Israel and for a lot of Palestinians who were there and completely disoriented and, and traumatized. I wanted to ask you as growing up in, in Nazareth um as a palestinian in a system that is trying to rip you of every part of your palestinian identity whether it's through the education system whether it's through you know civic any form how does how does how does the community of palestinians in 48 navigate that push and pull where you want to survive it's your form of samud right but at the same time it's it's the ultimate pressure on on trying to to squash that identity completely? Well, I have to say that uh, people tend from outside to look at us as Palestinians as if we were in a kind of a vacuum, mm. and, uh, which is not true because I think that very quickly um, uh, a good leadership was formed. Uh, uh, people who were active before 1948 who were leading the community and who continued and uh, uh, um, I can tell I, I wasn't at that point under the military role I wasn't an idea uh, uh, that existed anywhere but I, I keep hearing the stories for example about the heroic uh, uh uh first of may in 1958 in nazareth where uh, israel uh wanted to celebrate its 10 years of uh, establishment uh, of independence in uh, nazareth where usually the communists celebrated the first of may on the same day and uh, the communists, the communist party decided that they first of all will not allow to be, you know, stepped on and humiliated to have in Nazareth the uh, biggest city for the Palestinians in, uh, uh, in Israel to have the celebrations of 10 years of Israeli independence. So they called for uh, um, uh, the, the usual uh, march of uh, 1st of May. And uh, the police uh, uh, did not allow that and blocked all the entrances to Nazareth and from the night before. And the communists had to smuggle in in 1958 and to come in big groups and to do not allow the celebrations and to have the demonstrations and there were clashes and a lot of them were arrested and tortured mm. in the prison because they insisted not to celebrate the independence at that day so uh, this is kind of a story that i, I keep hearing but it's more i was born in 1964 but I was 
my teenaging and my adults, you know, I started to understand what is going on around me in a very special uh, time in our history because Nazareth was controlled and the municipality, the municipality of Nazareth was controlled by people who cooperated with the Israeli new system. And in 1975, uh, 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 the communists and their allies formed what is called the Democratic Front for Peace in Nazareth uh, and Equality. It, it actually was the Democratic Front of Nazareth. And uh, it was formed mainly by patriotic groups uh, uh, and the communists. And we managed to win the elections and to have Taufik Zayyad as uh, the mayor of Nazareth. Mm -hmm. And a new era started because that was the era of democratic, patriotic uh, forces, very progressive. Uh, not only uh, managing the municipality of Nazareth, but also started to form different groups in different uh, villages and towns. The I was at that point in, in 1976, I was only, you know, 12 years old. Mm. But I still uh, remember, uh, first of all, the landing where, uh, uh, you know, all the story of the land day where they tried through their uh, 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 collaborators from the um, municipalities to forbid the um, uh, strike, the big strike of the land day. And Taufik Zayad uh, then uh, 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 confronted them and said the people want the strike and the strike will be and was, that was the first general strike announced by the Palestinian community. And of course, we lost uh, uh, um, six martyrs in that day by the police forces. And you are 12 years old and you're seeing Nazareth uh, uh, with police uh, uh, arresting people. You hear the uh, uh, fire mm. and know about people who are losing their lives because they are defending the land. And then uh, uh, you grew up a little bit and you see how the state is forbidding any budgets from the municipality and want to make the people get rid of the municipality because it is a patriotic uh, uh, municipality with a great leader like Taufik mm -hmm. Zayad. And you start to be part of the uh, 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 volunteer camps uh, where every summer thousands of people coming from the West Bank, coming from all over the world to volunteer for 10 days in Nazareth and to uh, uh, build projects inside Nazareth because we were deprived from our and you grew up and, and you hear the, the, the songs uh, and you meet the people who are coming from the West Bank and you see Taufik Zayad with his passion and with his poets and you know that you are seeing, uh, uh, you are fo without knowing your identity is formed. Mm. Without paying attention or looking for literature to read or to understand what it is an identity, your identity is formed and it's a mixture. It's not only a nationalist approach, but it's a mixture of a human values, of uh, um, uh, loving uh, uh, the land and feeling connected and understanding that you are going through an oppressive, a, a, a mechanism and you are surviving and you are building something in you. So mm. our generation, I think that even in the school, we never, um, in the curriculum, official curriculum, 
we never under and you you will never see neither Mahmoud Darwish nor Tawfiq Zayad, who is the mayor of the city. We didn't know his poets except from Al Ittihad newspaper, mm -hmm. the newspaper of the Communist Party, which a few years later I became chief editor of it. So uh, there you start to know and to read. Uh, uh, about uh, uh, the, the poets, the stories, the short stories, and you start to be exposed to uh, um, uh, different factors that build up your identity. Mm -hmm. And do you think this, this, I mean, that's, I think that's a very specific, unique case of where civil engagement was met with civil disobedience, etc to formulate your political identity. But do you think this is true of the community within, within Palestinian, like Palestine and Palestinians in 48, overall where there is this sense of uh, nationalism and Palestinianness that still survives, even with today's generations? Or do you think there's a, still a struggle between the pressures of the Israeli state and their, their, their attempts at squashing that identity and maybe the community's uh, tug of war to, to establish it and, and keep it alive? I think it's um, it's an ongoing uh, struggle. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because even the Israel state did not is is developing all the time new mechanisms, mm -hmm. trying to control our lives and trying to control our consciousness, and this is what uh, what is more important because. Mm -hmm. Uh, 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 and you can see it in different uh, 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 stops or different junctions in our history where uh, uh, there is a kind of maddu um, jazer, how you say it, um, uh, when, you know, there, sometimes we are going ahead and sometimes the uh, 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 oppression is is pushing you back mm -hmm, mm -hmm. an ebb and flow yeah yeah and the mechanisms are very sophisticated mm -hmm. we have to uh especially i i think the uh, uh patriotic uh, 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 groups have uh, uh, donated very much to the awareness of the people and to strengthening those feelings and the fact that we managed for certain uh, time to have our alternative mechanisms like yeah. i told you we had our uh, a, a newspaper that was uh, uh, giving the people the real information and giving the people uh, the political and awareness and through literature and through um, uh, you know, hosting the best uh, poeters among the Palestinians, also pushing this awareness more. And it's not by chance that when you talk about Shu'ara al muqawama the resistance poeters, yeah. if you start naming them, they are mostly coming uh, 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 from 1948, yeah. uh, uh, coming from Palestinians who lived uh, uh, in the state of Israel after its establishment, like yeah. Dr. Ayad, like Mahmoud Darwish, like Salim Jubran, and of course, Emil Habibi as, as a writer, and you know. Yeah. The, we had to create alternative forms. In my opinion, the political parties and the political organizations played a major role in creating an alternative channel where my, uh, uh, especially my, uh, uh, the people who in my age uh, could be exposed to this because you have to try to imagine a world without internet and without <laughs> this huge access to information in the world and you only barely, you could, you could see um, a newspaper. I still remember when the first time we had TV in my house. Uh, so we were very much kind in 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 a 
bubble created by Israel. I don't want to say bubble because it sounds cozy, but in a ghetto. Yeah. In a real ghetto. Uh, and when it comes to information, when it comes to, and without having inside this community uh, those who uh, uh, were active in creating the alternative uh, um, uh, uh, reality for us, I think we could have lost really uh, parts of our identity, parts of our uh, relation to our own people. Um, yeah, I, I, I want to tell you, I, so I need a permit to, to, to go to 1948. And I visited Haifa for the first time in my life, not too long ago. And one thing that surprised me uh, in a way that it, it, was, it was almost, it was a, in, in a, um, there was, there's a romantic element to it. I went and saw Palestinian restaurants playing Palestinian music and, and uh, Palestinian literature and culture very alive and vibrant within the city. And it surprised me and it took me by surprise because it was such a powerful statement of identity. Mm -hmm. And uh, the more I spoke to, you know, Palestinians there, you know, they said there is a resurgence. Um, but there was one also that was very prominent in the 70s and the 80s amongst the students. Uh, and so I don't know if you experienced that yourself and, and what was that like? Well, this is um, this is my generation. The yeah, exactly. <laughs> in the eighties. Uh, well, uh, yes, I, I I told you in the beginning that my mom told me, "You're going to study. You're not going to do politics, um, and please be careful." And especially, you know, I'm coming from. Uh, uh, I can say almost a low uh, socioeconomic uh, uh, family uh, situation. And I was the first among seven girls to go to the university. So it's, it's a big issue for the family. All the family was like uh, trying to, to support and to finance my study and so on. Mm -hmm. And the first and she knew that I'm, I'm very eager always to be engaged in politics and I'm always asking questions and I'm always trying to understand why we live in such a way and, and uh, to compare the situation. And when I, and there was a very active student movement at that point, uh, very, uh, and, and, Plural, because there were the communists and the nationalists, Abna El Balad, and mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, we had uh, organized ourselves have a, a students committee in each university, and then we had the uh, 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 student, um, uh, sorry, the students. Uh, um, union from all the universities and i have to say that most of the political leadership today i mean in the last 10 years have risen from that uh, mm -hmm. students movement like muhammad baraki like uh, uh, isam makhoul like jamal zahalqa like uh, azm bishara all of them were in the student movement at that point and you have to understand at that point, either you were a, um, uh, a small worker, small in the meaning not high official, but mm -hmm. like my father, a constructing uh, uh, building worker, uh, which could not really uh, be in a, in a confrontation with the uh, employee, or where you could meet the Jewish community really, when we are living in our towns and villages, mm -hmm. and isolated from the everyday of Jewish life, the first meeting is in the university. Yeah. This is where the first time the Palestinians and the Israeli Jews are meeting and on a, almost equal level. Both of us are students. We are not working for them. They are not hiring us. 
There is no this hierarchy, but we are equal and we are young and we are proud of ourselves as if, you know, the, um, uh, 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 those who were privileged to become students from our own community. And there was the real, uh, uh, let's say, um, first of all, we had two levels of confrontation. One, vis-a-vis -vis the uh, uh, administration in the university. And second, vis-a-vis -vis the students themselves. Mm -hmm. We had to differentiate ourselves and to, I, I always believe that your, our identity is not one thing only, mm -hmm. it's one-sided, but it's a mixture of different identities that come together. But when you feel threatened the most in certain part of it, then you expose it more. Mm -hmm. Then you make it uh, uh, bigger. And that's what happened. When I was living in Nazareth, it wasn't so important to say every day that I'm Palestinian because I am living with the Palestinians. But when you go to the university and you see the uh, Jewish students who want to uh, humiliate you or who look from up to you, mm -hmm. down to you, then you want to be proud of your Palestinian mm -hmm. identity. Then you want to tell them, I'm the owner. I am the real people of this place. Mm -hmm. and that came out in different activities and different uh, um, political engagement. And in the first month, I was elected to sit in the committee um, of students. And my parents had to read about this in the newspapers. So. You, you didn't tell your mother you, you disobeyed her orders. Yeah, yeah. My <laughs> if i told you go and run for an office uh, this is this interests me a lot i i want to understand more what type of conversations uh, you had amongst yourselves as palestinians i mean what were topics of discussion what were you aspiring for what what did you want to fight for was it at that stage we want to be equal in a in a state and a system that's uh that maintains supremacy of one people over another treats as second-class citizens, uh, not enough resources, etc. Or were there bigger conversation on a more nationalist level within the Palestinian national movement? Or was it both? I think it was a mixture. It was a mixture because on one hand, I mean, when I got to the university, very soon there was the first intifada. Mm -hmm. And... Um, uh, the the oppression that was going on and the understanding that there is a liberation Palestinian movement uh, uh, that need to be echoed and voiced inside the Israeli society mm -hmm. that's very important. But at the same level, we also were fighting for equal rights and national rights inside uh, Israel. And national rights, it's not always creating our own state. National rights, it's also to be recognized uh, as a, a, a national minority, as a national group, with all of our rights as a national group, including preserving our uh, identity, preserving our uh, uh, culture, our uh, heritage, and and protecting our uh, wakf and and you know all of that, mm -hmm. and to have a, a political uh, a representation for us uh, on the national level. Mm -hmm. uh, I still remember we were very very. Uh, uh, busy also, for example, of uh, uh, supporting uh, uh, our people uh, in the first intifada and, and trying to bring, uh, demonstrating inside Israel to solidarate or to, not to solidarate, but to uh, influence the Israeli society and to echo the voices of our people. 
but at the same time also bringing support and and uh, how you call it um um rapi um uh, help aid aid for our uh, 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 people in the west bank i still mm -hmm. remember the uh, uh protest that we need to lead at that point so it's it's a mixture of also trying to create a new uh, uh, reality for ourselves as citizens of Israel, but also as a national minority. And at the same time, to uh, um, use that reality that we are creating to bring our, the voices of our own people who are mm -hmm. under occupation since 1967. Yeah, that's that's very interesting. One thing I wanted to pick up that you mentioned is, and it's a debate that I've had with a lot of my friends, uh, Palestinians from 48 and elsewhere, is about, do you participate in the Israeli regime and electoral system uh, and, and be part of that? Or do you try to uh, not be part of it, but engage in other types of political activity, right? Do you run for office, national office, for the Knesset, or is there better forms of political disobedience or civic engagement that can be done out? Right? What What do you say to those two positions? Well, as you know, you introduced me as member of the Knesset. Yeah. So probably you know what I already choose. Sure. I I listen. I. If it is an ideological boycott, um, I can, you know, I can tolerate more than those who are talking about boycotting out of uh, helplessness, mm -hmm. out of feeling I'm not able to do anything, it's ridiculous, it's so on. Uh, I believe that it's not an issue of participating only in the elections in israel it's an mm -hmm. issue which kind of solution you see for this situation mm -hmm. because if you are still believing that there is a possibility or you are heading and believing that the most likable solution at this mm -hmm. is a two-state solution uh, uh, you will continue to fight for your place in the state that you are in. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise, if you are calling for a one state solution and you are waiting till annexation happens mm -hmm. and there will be an apartheid regime and we will turn the fight for the Palestinian fight for liberation into a civil right movement, mm -hmm. one man, one vote, or one woman, one vote, uh, uh, that's another issue. Yeah. Then you that's don't have to participate now in this system. Yeah. It's even then, we mm -hmm. have to remember that eventually the South African movement or any movement who will call for uh, 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 yani eventually there will be a fight to participate in election mm -hmm. there yeah, no. will be a fight for the right of voting sure absolutely the, the thing is so there's the there's the ideological one sentence to add yeah i don't yani my problem with those who are saying this as if if you are in the parliament mm -hmm. or if you choose to vote you are neglecting all other strategies of yeah. resistance yeah. which is not true yeah you can combine different strategies and try to affect wherever you can mm -hmm. and sometimes the parliamentarian work without all the work that is done on a on a, a on a public or in the uh, among the people and to create a kind of a situation of resistance uh, uh, is it, it can't bring any uh, the parliamentarian work without all of that mm -hmm. it can bring any uh, results yeah and if you only go on that 
type of work, sometimes you need to translate it into a power to change the system. Yeah. So that's no, I think that I think that's a very good point. And and so saying that if you know, uh, engaging in potentially, you know, the, the electoral system within Israel uh, needs to be accompanied with other types of, of, of uh, initiatives and strategies more broadly to, to, to engage with, with systems of oppression. But sometimes the, the question revolves around, well, there's the ideological part, but then there's the strategic part. So what is the strategic value of engaging with the system that is not likely to, to nudge and so the argument or the criticism I often hear is, well, we're not strategically getting any wins. I mean, the most example, most recent election and the coalition, uh, but we're still participating in legitimizing. What, what, do you, what do you make of that? Do you think that's fair? What fair? The, the criticism of that there's no strategic, we're not, re, we're, there's no fruit, that we're not reaping any strategic fruit from engaging in elections. Or, or any wins, but at the same time, we're we might be legitimizing that political process. Well, first of all, I don't think I'm legitimizing anything. I think that uh, um, the fact that we are so critical and we are so vocal inside the parliament, it's not a testimony that the Israeli system is democratic. Mm -hmm. And everybody knows, at least we are revealing this. We are criticizing, we are uh, uh, showing the world how undemocratic it is. We cannot deny the fact that the formal, we never say that there is a real substance, substantial democracy in Israel. Mm -hmm. We know that there is a formal democracy. The formal democracy of the right to elect and to be elected. And I believe that as long as this formal election managed to give the word and to be used by Israel to say, look, we are giving them the possibility to elect, that was fine. The minute that we started to use that right eventually in the last two elections in a different way and to grow as a real political power that can you know put pressure mm -hmm. the israeli system became became more aggressive and actually i believe that we helped in revealing this aggressiveness mm -hmm. more than anybody who did not vote i the see that we became 15 members in the Knesset and the fact that they have now to and they started to reveal the right-wing government mm -hmm. and some of those who are called liberal Zionists or they call themselves leftist Zionists okay I don't mm -hmm. know it, but they were pushed in my opinion, to the corner and started to reveal more and more aggressiveness in trying to oppress that possibility of influence that we are pushing for. Mm -hmm. You can see that in, in practices in the Knesset, you can see that in practices in public, you can see it in legislation. And I think the world is more opening their eyes and, and understanding when we are putting out these practices. Mm -hmm. I, I would like to see someone of those who are saying not to participate, to tell me what their strategy mm -hmm. if we win the parliament. And you have to understand, I'm, I look at participating in the elections and being elected as a tactic. It's a tool. It's not an end. It's not. Mm -hmm. a, it's not my cause. Mm -hmm. It's a tool that I'm using in my struggle. If I see, and if I get to uh, 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 believe that I'm, I'm not doing anything, and I'm not, and I'm actually serving the system. I don't have a problem to go out and to say, okay, this tool helped us. For a while, 
Now what we have to reevaluate and to reconsider. And we, you need to also to remember that we also are representing people who have civil rights and everyday life and they want to protect it and we want to protect it. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think, I mean, I, I looked at the polling and I looked at, uh, you know, the Palestinian communities within 48 uh, and their demand for, for basic services, uh, basic civil rights, etc. Um, and is one of the reasons also, you know, why there was high turnout um, for, for the joint list. But you said something very interesting. So I'm, I'm, I'm now as a Palestinian sitting in the West Bank. I look at the Palestinian national movement. I don't know where we're going. I don't know what we want. And, and this is why I think what you said about it being a tactic is, is, is spot on and which I'd like to explore a bit more. I, I'm from Jericho originally, uh, from Jericho and the Jordan Valley. And so they're talking about annexation of the land all around Jericho. You go talk to anyone in Jericho, they say, how do you feel about Israeli annexation? They say, oh, I thought we were already annexed um, because we don't have access to anything around our lands uh, already. So the question is, you look at a map, you see that the, there's one entity, one regime that already controls everything, all our lives. And you're either unfree, all right, or unequal or both. And you look at where we are in our history and you see Palestinian communities that are more fragmented than ever. You know, the, the, there's a West Bank identity and that cares about the West Bank struggle. There's a Gaza identity cares about the Gaza struggle, East Jerusalem. You have also, you have also Northern West Bank and so. Exactly, we're extremely fragmented and there's no principle, there's no political vision, there's no strategy that ties my immediate struggle to your immediate struggle. I feel for all the Palestinians in 48 that want a good life. They, Sumudhum is also important. All these things matter. But at the same time, the question then is, how do you connect that to a bigger national movement that is now reflective of the reality on the ground and where we are? And, and so what, what, play, what role do you, do, do you as a member of Knesset have as a leader within 48? to start maybe communicating or talking about what's coming into the future, especially after Israel formally annexes, you know, big parts of the West Bank. Well, you are, you are actually um, asking me questions that we are in mid of very uh, extensive uh, uh, deliberations and discussions and, and we are trying really uh, uh, to figure out, and I was just saying yesterday, for my regret in one of the meetings, we are talking about annexation as if it's going to happen for the first time in the history of Israel. This is not true. And for our regret, whoever is thinking that the world will go, you know, wild and, and forbid it, mm -hmm what happened when they annexed Jerusalem and when they annexed the Golan, Assyrian Golan, Al Julan, uh, and and uh, have to understand that we are in a very bad uh, era where uh, we are fragmentized and we are not only geographically fragmentized, we are politically fragmentized. Yeah. We are. We have the the Palestinian division, which is, I think, the most horrible thing that ever happened to us after the Nakba and the Naksa. Uh, and uh, uh, the question is, of course, when you are seeing the threat, you are thinking how to stop that threat in the beginning. Mm -hmm. Instead of thinking that, okay, annexation is going to happen, it's going to happen, let's think what will be after. I, I'm, uh, I at least believe that what we should be busy now with is try really to create a situation of uh, not only opposition, but a real resistance to the uh, uh, annexation. 
we understand that the world is not in its best situation. I think that Netanyahu is going to use uh, uh, the COVID-19 uh, uh, crisis internationally where every big country is busy with its own problem mm -hmm. of how to deal with the crisis and their possibilities to, to deal with the Palestinian issue now is very limited. Second, uh, uh, the fact that Trump is heading to his election and there is a threat on his uh, uh, re being re-elected and Netanyahu would like to use that time, first of all, to put pressure on, on uh, Trump to get his uh, uh, support for this step and to uh, uh, use what is left from the time. If he will be re-elected, that's fine, but let's use the time until yeah. he's sitting in the White House. This is how Netanyahu uh, uh, feels. And for my regret, the Arab world is, is, uh, is not going to show a real resistance to no. this. It's not even some support to it. So first of all, I think it's, it's up to, as usual, it's in the hands of the Palestinian people to resist. This is the, the, the main thing. Are we developing uh, uh, good strategies for this resistance? I think not yet. And time is running out. Time is running out. And I think even if Netanyahu is not going to implement on the ground, although I believe he might do it, uh, uh, the annexation, he already in the minds of the Israelis, he won the battle. Mm -hmm. he managed to settle in the minds of the Israelis that it is legitimate to annexate the Jordan Valley. Yeah. Of course, the uh, settlement. This brings up a this brings up the question, you know, for, for someone who grew up under the Oslo era, I'm I'm 31. I, that's all the only reality I've known living in Palestine is 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 promise of a state, more settlements. It's it's that ebb and flow. And for a lot of us that grew up and seeing that, we don't really believe that the two-state solution under the Oslo paradigm is feasible because you essentially, if you want to base it on the parameters of land swaps. You need to move, even if you don't move all the settlements, you need to move anywhere from 200 to 350,000 settlers over the Green Line. Now you have settlers at the heart of the Israeli government. They're not going to move their own people anywhere. The Jewish-Israeli part of Israeli society is extremely right-wing. So there's no formula where you see within Israel that, that will allow for the two-state solution to happen. As you said, we're alone. Uh, the world is not going to stop there's, no, there's not going to be accountability proportional to what's happening on the ground. The Arab world is busy, busy with other things. So it comes down to us. And I think, as you said, we need to have the conversation of what happens next, strategically, mm -hmm. not just tactically, strategically and, and in terms of the vision we want. And I'm wondering, are those conversations happening with, with the members of Knesset, with the political parties, with the community within the 48? Because you know, not all of us know uh, because we're so disconnected as all communities. Um, kind of where, where people are, where people are thinking, uh, what role we're going to be playing. You know, my, my problem with this um, discourse is that it is going around what the Israeli government and what the settler settlers want and is not saying what the Palestinians want. Mm -hmm. And I think the liberation movement is not, is supposed to, first of all, rebel against what the settlers and the colonialists want. Mm -hmm. And not co-op and to try how to survive with their needs. And I can understand as someone who was raised under 
in the era of Oslo agreements that you did not see a different uh, uh, model of resistance. But first of all, I think the Palestinian people should ask themselves, we should ask ourselves what we want. Yeah. Uh, what? Because if you want to go out and fight there, you need to know what you are fighting for. Mm -hmm. Are you fighting for the right to be equal and to vote in the Israeli system as a Palestinian in the West Bank? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are you fighting for liberation from occupation? and to establish a Palestinian state, and then to start fight what kind of a Palestinian state is it going to be democratic, yeah. Islamic, uh, controlled by, I don't know. But in the beginning, you need to know what are you fighting for, not what the Israelis want. Mm -hmm. The colonialists want all the land. Mm -hmm. The colonialists want to keep the settlements. The colonialists want to take every small piece of land that don't have a Palestinian on top of it. And if it has, they can, you know, remove him and take the land. So that's what they want. Okay. We know that over the history. The people did not liberate themselves because they took into consideration the the occupation well mm -hmm. and this is I, I i believe this is the major issue to change the discourse and to start to think what what is the goal and how it's going to be reached you know mm -hmm. because for me saying that annexation will happen and there will not be any option for Palestinian state and let's start fighting for a civil rights movement declaring you are by saying this declaring the end of the Palestinian liberation movement uh, uh, fight struggle and declaring that actually uh, uh, the uh, Palestinian national project mm -hmm. and Zionism has won. I hope I will not live to that day. I mean, I don't see it in such a way. I believe that there are steps can be made through the process to change the rules of the game. Mm -hmm. What 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 can what what can we do? Created rules for that game. That game. Sorry that I'm using the word game for mm -hmm. that model, for that reality. And without changing the rules and disobeying the rules, mm -hmm. and going out against it, you cannot change them. Otherwise, you will be um, adopting yours, adapting yourself into them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I I don't disagree with a lot of what you said, uh, MK. I think it, it it's about if we want if we still want the two state solution under Oslo, what is the strategy to do that, and what are you pragmatically facing? Right, it's a, it's about strategy and being able to leverage your power as a people. And at the moment, when you look at that landscape, being able to develop something that is, around, is, a, is allowing you to secure that seems to be, you know, nearly, nearly impossible. Um, and I, I, don't, I don't necessarily think it's the death of the national movement or Palestinian national struggle if we pivot. I think we've pivoted in our national history in the 1970s from one democratic state to to, to two states and in, in 1998. And I don't think a pivot back to, or, or a, a different evolution is, is necessarily closing the door on 
the Palestinian pursuit of self-determination. I think it's just being redefined uh, because at the end of the day, we're also, there's a power asymmetry, right? Where it's not just Palestinians against Israelis, it's also Palestinians against the US and, and the structures that uh, the EU and the US have funded and supported and the rest of the world. And so, okay, based on that reality, how can you then maximize the rights, the freedoms of your people? Um, and, and that's what I think we're looking at. Uh, so do you, do, do you, what do you think is the way forward? What do you think personally is, should be the vision of, of the national movement? It's a big question. No, it's a big question. <laughs> Listen, I, I, I wish I can say that uh, it can be a dream to have a binational, democratic, secular state for the two people to live together. For me, this is, um, uh, this is even harder mm -hmm. to achieve at this point than the two-state solution. I see it even further and harder and not reachable more than the two-state solution. Because of all the reasons you mentioned till now. Mm -hmm. Because of uh, the uh, balance of power. Because till now, what the Palestinian people managed to do is to convince the world that they are the underdog in this story and they are the ones who are deprived of their life, uh, of, of their right of self-determination and they are living under occupation. Starting now, under this balance of power, to speak about uh, 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 the one state solution when Israel is pushing the narrative of the uh, uh, um, victim and pushing the narrative of the importance of having the Jewish state as if moving the a threat from a threat on the right of the Palestinians mm -hmm. to have the right uh, self-determination and as if creating that threat at least an illusion in, in, in a way of thinking on the Jewish state, I don't see it as something that contributes to the struggle in this. Mm -hmm. Second, I think that um, it's, it's up to the whole Palestinian people to decide if they want to say, okay, we didn't manage with our national project till today and we are moving it to a kind of a struggle to be part of this state and then as if to struggle for many years to come maybe to create the state that can be that kind of a democratic state for everybody who is living in the one state solution Settlements are in the borders of the one state. Mm -hmm. uh, is anybody going to speak about them as illegal or are they going to be totally legal? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's a very good point. How equal uh, citizenship in that forthcoming state. Take us as an example, Yassidi. 72 years mm -hmm. fighting for equal civil rights. Where are we? Yeah. I don't know. I, I think that, in my opinion, raising this at this point is admitting that the Palestinian national struggle for liberation of occupation has failed. Mm. and now transformed into a way of adapting into the colonialized uh, reality. Yeah, no, I think, listen, I, you, you bring up a lot of really good points. And the issue of settlements, 
is you know if we if there's a pivot to one state uh, there must there be a, a process of decolonization of that construct of, of supremacy of you having the right to 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 land and and someone uh, does not uh, the idea and the whole conception of a settlement as a jewish only con community right would would no longer exist i think that's that would be uh, an argument to that point one thing i i, I wanted to make sure we talked about uh, during this interview was uh, you being part of women against violence and, and all you all you've done for uh, women's rights and the women's movement uh, and we wanted to sh make sure we we had the opportunity for you to share that with with the audience and the viewers well um in 1992 we were um a group of women who were um, um also friends and activists who were shocked uh, every time by the, by the stories of women that we knew either from our professional life or private life uh, who are uh, victims of violence and um, um, we were shocked also of the um, murder crimes that uh, happened at that point and uh, decided not to continue to be silent about it. Of course that was breaking a taboo that was um, um, going over the edge and, and, and really to challenge what was existing at that point. And we managed very quickly to uh, organize ourselves and to bring more and more women and to create the first crisis center uh, for uh, women victims of violence or survivors of violence and the first shelter for battered women women in the world in 1993 shelters one for women and one for young women and from there um, this organization became a leading organization in uh, the Palestinian uh, society but also on the level of the Arab world and internationally where um, we were not only developing the issue of uh, um, uh, 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 services for women who were survivors of violence but also changing the whole uh, 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 way of thinking and conscious social conscious about the uh, uh, status of women in society we were challenging the existing mm -hmm. force that existed at that time and I, I modestly I say that I'm very proud of the fact that when I look there's generations of women who were affected by women against violence, not only as a service, uh, as services that were used, but also as the values and the uh, a feminist revolution that happened in the process. Uh, I think that we challenged a lot of the taboos, not only uh, the one that is about violence against women, but also about the right of women on their bodies, the fact that women have the right to decide for themselves, that women, we change the stereotype that women um, is not only in the decision making cycles, but also they are leading processes inside the society. They are giving a model to other uh, young generations who can look up and whenever I'm meeting young women who are saying to me but either you know you've been talking about this since 1992 and nothing has changed women are still violated and i usually say to them you know when i was in your age i didn't understand that you i have the right to say these words very loudly and to be critical to the society the fact that you are able to do it now the fact that none of the politicians dare even to legitimize violence against women. This is an achievement. This is a change. Of course, we did not reach whatever we wanted, but we've been talking for an hour and a half now about things that we didn't manage to reach. But at least in this era, we managed to make a change. That's, that's amazing. I thank you. And that's, uh, you know, amazing work. And, uh, I, I, I want to say thank you for joining us and it was an amazing conversation and I hope it's a conversation that one day we'll, 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 um, we'll continue and have more answers, um, <laughs> hopefully.
Well, thank you so much. And uh, yeah. In my age, I learned that, in my age, I learned that when you are young, you are less optimistic than when you are old looking back what you, what have changed already. So yeah. changes happen. No, I, I, I hear you. And I think it's for a, a, lot of, a lot of lessons to be learned from amazing experiences. And that's been part of the privilege of, of talking to you and so many amazing others is understanding the history and understanding what has been come before and, and, and the challenges and, and the way people have been over, able to overcome it. Uh, but no, it's, it's very inspiring. Uh, and and, that's, and that's, that's the most important thing. It's also very important that you know how to ask the questions that challenge people to think. Thank exactly. you for a wonderful conversation. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Yeah, I'll take it half you. My salam and shukran.